As a child, it, we would go to the bluffs and play Tarzan and that sort of stuff. It was the greatest playground in the world. The thing that I remember the most is that I went horseback riding on the bluffs. So that, that was a fun, a fun day. Uh, there was always a dance on Saturday night over at the Royal Theater. When we'd go home, you could still hear them playing. When you were trying to sleep, you could still hear the drifting down the street. It was great. The location of the town is, is very magical. You, you have the river bottom floodplain area where the town was built. You have the, the bluffs, the river bluffs that are right next to the town, which provide a, a constant palette of color for the people that are living in that area. You got the beautiful green in the spring and the, the, uh, the golds and, and yellows of the, the autumn season. Uh, it, it is just a very beautiful place. Well, I, I think any time you grow up in my situation in a small community where, where you knew everybody, everybody knew you, and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good, it, it makes for a situation that I always have Valmar in my heart. Valmar was a pretty neat little town. There was 700 of us when I was growing up, as I recall. And, you know, your parents told you you can go this far on your bike this year, and the next year you might get a few more blocks. And by the time you were sixth, seventh grade, you were, had the whole town. And then we'd, we really enjoyed climbing around the bluffs when we were kids. We'd go up to the Star, and there was a white rock mine that we'd ride our bikes to south of town and go snooping around in there. And sometimes you'd, uh, find air shafts from the quarry when you're up in the bluff here. And it was just a neat place. It's special because it's always been rural, but yet we had access to a city. You know, it wasn't completely rural like some other areas. Uh, it has a good history of uh, change from uh, being nothing and then building up as a town when the uh, steam engines came through. Uh, Valmeyer was a kind of a combination of several different ideas. They were trying to come up with the name for the town and were looking at the names of various individuals that had been instrumental in putting the town together and finally decided that the perfect name would be a combination of valley, since it was in the river valley, and to include the name of the founding family, the Meyer family. Actually, the first name that they came up with was Valley City, and that was too close to another town name in southern Illinois, and the post office wouldn't let them use that. So then it eventually became Valley of the Myers, which was shortened to Valmeyer. The area around Valmeyer started with development back in the middle 1800s. And most of the activity in this area was in Harrisonville and along the river because of all of the steamboat traffic that was coming through during that time period. The local people would make a very good living cutting down the trees and selling cordwood to the steamboats that came through that they would use as their fuel. So that started the economic activity. Then to boost that, you had the fertile farm ground that was in the river bottom areas here. That was basically a result of all of the flooding that took place along the Mississippi River. Every time it flooded, it would leave a new layer of very fertile topsoil, which was great for farming. The real boost to the Valmar area was right around the turn of the century, late 1800s, 1900, when the railroad built through. Railroad came through from St. Louis, building south, 
uh, rail, the first part of the railroad, first set of track was completed about 1905 and then came back, they came back from the south and built north with the second track and completed that about 1909. Once the railroad built, all of the businesses started springing up that were there in support of the railroad. You had, in many cases, hundreds of people that were here working on building the railroad and supporting it when it first came through. So they all needed a place to stay, a place to eat. The businesses that started springing up were mainly businesses in support of that, hotels, tavern type businesses where the men could stay, have a few drinks after work and get a good meal. In addition to that, it was their link to go out and find the outside world. There were a lot of people that would ride the passenger train, which was called the Dinky, out of Valmire to go to other places. So as that happened, more and more people started settling in the area and eventually there were enough people to farm a town. Through the years, the, the farming community that was around the town became really uh, one of the main sources of income for the businesses that were there. So it, the Valmar through the years was very much a support center for the farming community that surrounded it. Well, we've been on the farm. My grandfather was here. We've been here for over 100 years. We just love to be down here. The quarry complex, let's call it, was probably one of the, the, the best things that ever happened to the Valmar area and was, was very integral in the success of the people that lived in Valmar. They started the quarry here to mine the rock that was later used under the rail bed of the railroad. Following that, they continued with the development of the quarry most of the rock that was used there was used as ag lime. It was ground into a powder that was then spread on the fields for a uh, kind of a supplement to the soil to add some minerals to it. There were some large contracts that they had with companies that produced shingles and also it was used for the production of glass. It was shipped out to some other facilities for that. Interesting about the quarry complex was that not only was it very important for the production of rock, but in the areas where the rock had been mined before, the, in the first operation that started uh, for the mushroom farm was in 1930, where they went into the quarry, the cave areas, started growing mushrooms. And that operation continued into the early 1980s. What you would find is that in many cases, an entire family would earn their living at that complex. Husband and wife would get in the car in the morning and they would drive up the hill to the quarry. Husband would work at the quarry, the wife would work at the mushroom farm. So in many cases, the family income was very dependent on that one facility. Life in the old town was more quiet, um, more relaxed atmosphere. You really didn't have to worry about your kids running around town because, you know, when the five o'clock whistle blew, the kids knew it was time to come home for supper, and when the lights came on, it was time to get home because it was dark. You know, when you come to Valmar and you're gonna live here, work here, you wave at everybody you meet in town because everybody waves at you, whether they know you or not, and they know you by your car, you know, by what you're driving. They don't really know you by your car more than maybe until they get to know you. Yeah, I used to joke when I was in high school that my parents found out about what I did before I finished it. So there was, uh, you had a lot of, uh, a lot of adults kind of making sure you stayed out of major problems anyway. People helped one another so much, and this would be one example. Our neighbor, Joe Algar, when he finished working at the quarry, would take my sister, his daughter, and me to the lake to swim, and he taught us how to swim. 
and he taught us how to swim by blowing up a bicycle inner tube and tying it somehow in the middle and somehow we had a little harness and so that's how my sister and I learned how to swim. Valmar was a very neat place. Uh, we used to spend a lot of time going up in the bluffs and uh, we had uh, swings in the bluffs where we would actually swing on ropes and it was just a, a very neat place to live. One of the most beautiful places to see is uh, coming home, coming through Valmar, the beautiful bluffs and just, just knowing you're running in, in the backyard of all your friends, houses and the fields. Valmar had experienced floods through the years. The flooding was nothing new to the community. The flooding uh, in recent history goes back to the 1880s. There was a major flood then, flood in 1903. The uh, first flood of any consequence in recent history was in 1943. What we found in, in that time period was that um, the water levels were not that great. The, so along with that, you didn't have the damage that occurred to the properties. Uh, the people in this area and how they have the hard work attitude and the pluck that they went in with a broom and swept the, the, the mud that was left and shoveled everything out and washed everything down and moved back in their homes. Uh, I actually uh, remember the old uh, amphibian boat uh, that, that came down the street of Main Street in the water and all of a sudden it kept on going on the road with wheels. Uh, that, that is a memory I, I'm still shocked about. I think it was my first time seeing anything like that. Had to sleep upstairs in the attic and uh, Daddy fished in the front yard and uh, they rowboated from the drugstore over to our house and so to me it wasn't a hard time. No devastation in those times. There was no big break. It was a small break. And I remember climbing out of the upstairs window onto the porch with my mom and dad and into an amphibious boat because the Corps at that time insisted we get out. Another flood came in in 1947. That again <clears throat> was a major problem because it was a little bit deeper as far as the water levels, a little bit more damage. So the people went to their folks that were in control of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at that time and they said, can we get some assistance? So between 1947 and 1950, a protective levee system was built from north to south along the entire western border of our county. That in turn protected the entire area here of Monroe County, not just Valmeyer, up until 1993. Well, we started having our first major problems in June of 93. The, the river system was being challenged to its limits going back to the end of 92 already. You could see in the northern reaches of the river system in this area that the, the snow melt that was coming along in the fall, the rain that landed in this area during the fall months, uh, were already filling up the river channel. Then in the spring, which is the time that you really get a lot of water coming down from the north, as you get spring rains and the majority of the snow melt, that causes a lot of problems for the local levee systems. It became evident as we would work on the levee system that if another community somewhere nearby us had a problem, had a levee break, whatever the case could be, it would always relieve the pressure on our levee system. And as morbid as it sounds, one of the things that we did for uh, keeping ourselves amused was had a system of le levy lotto that we were playing where we were trying to determine who would be the next community that was going to have a levy break. We never wanted it to be us, that was for sure, but um, it was to the point where you were hoping that another community would have a break because it would help us every time it did. Uh, after the levees were built in the 40s, I think the, the devastating floods that were going to damage or destroy the town were 
supposed to be no more. Well, it did give us a false sense of security. Probably if the psychologist would phrase it best, uh, in denial. Absolute, it's not going to happen. There's no way it's going to happen. So I wasn't going to show any emotions. I didn't think it was going to be that bad, but they were telling people, you know, you need to get your stuff out of your house and get prepared. And I was one that listened to my dad because he, he went through all the floods prior to that. And he said, anything waist high and above, you don't have to worry about. So we went through and put a lot of stuff in top of the closets, you know, thinking that, oh, it'll be safe up there. We were told that, oh, it's going to have to be so many feet for so long before you're going to have any damage. Well, no, didn't, nobody expected it was going to reach the level that it did. At one point, I told my wife, we'll move our stuff to the second story. We live on the east side of the railroad tracks. If we get any water, it'll never come in the house. Uh, I was a non-believer that Valmire was ever going to flood. The beginning of the end started for us when the levee broke in Columbia, which eventually became our problem. And it's the image that you see all of the time when you hear about the 1993 flood. It's where the farmstead washes away one building at a time. First the grain bins go, and then the outbuildings, and eventually the barn. And the last thing to go is the big two-story farmhouse, which starts washing away and then crumbles in the force of the river as it's washing through the levee. We had a crew of people that were sandbagging directly west of the town along the Mississippi levee. And when the break occurred in Columbia, there was a drop suddenly, just instantly, of about 12 inches in the river level where the people were working to the west of Almar. And the people that were working on that crew thought, this is great, we've got some relief here only to realize that shortly after that, it was going to become our problem. At that point, the effort as far as doing anything to try to stop the water that was coming across had to be called off. It was dark, there was nothing we could do anymore safely without putting people in harm's way. And at that point, I called in to the flood control center and I told them to activate the siren in town and make sure that everyone was out. By that point, we had already issued a mandatory evacuation order, but we still had some people in town that were working with the emergency crews. So we wanted to make sure everybody got out that we didn't have any problems with. The person who was in control of the utilities uh, we had a hate-love relationship. Uh, he had showed up uh, shortly after we had started the flood fight telling me that he was gonna shut the town down because it was much better for his power generation if he didn't have to worry about that during a flood. And I told him politely, get your ass out of town because we're not gonna flood and I don't need you shutting everything down. We had people living in town yet. So, that's the way our relationship started. Over the course of the weeks, uh, he kind of kept um, arm's length and watched what we were doing. Really gained respect for the way the people here were working hard to make sure that everything was under control. So probably about two weeks after that, he came to me and he said, you guys are doing a great job. You tell me when you think we've got problems. So that night, after I came back into town, I was standing on the edge of the cemetery, kind of looking out over the town at that, at that point. And that's when things were slowing down a little bit and trying to figure out, okay, what's going to happen here? And he came walking up to me and he said, uh, where are we? And I said, well, Lynn, I said, I think it's time to turn out the lights. And that was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I stood there and watched as street by street, Valmar went dark. At that point, Jed, I'm thinking, you know, that's, that's all right. I knew what the people did in the 40s. They went in and shoveled up and washed out and everything's gonna be fine. You know, it would have been even more drastic at that point if I'd have known it was the last time that the lights would have been on in Valmar.
it's heartbreaking. Uh, you see these people that have lived their, their whole lives, they have a whole history of generations behind them, and then it's all gone. We went up to the bluffs and looked down at all that flood water, and it was all over, miles and miles. You could see Valmar from the top of the bluffs, and it was under water. Well, it was just a great sense of loss because, you, you know, if you had anything in there, you lost everything you left behind. And when we did get to see our house, the first time we went out in a boat, they were given boat rides and you could go, you know, look at your house. When we went out, you, can, you could probably see a couple inches at the top of our house yet, and that was it. A lot of people took the, uh, um, the position that they didn't want to go back into those homes because they were severely damaged. And I think the worst thing was a lot of those houses had water in them for, you know, up to six weeks. You know, which it didn't just come up and drop immediately. It came up, it stayed, it took a while far to drop. Those are the people that really, you know, that I really felt sorry for were the older people that, you know, their whole life has been spent down here and, and they, see, they see that wash away. We knew with the amount of damage that we had, we were going to have problems, first of all, with FEMA and what they were going to allow us to do to rebuild. We also knew that we were going to have problems with the citizens themselves. With the amount of damage they had to their structures, it was a pretty good punch in the stomach that these people had gotten. We knew that a lot of people were just gonna wanna turn tail and run to start off with. We knew that other people, maybe because of financial reasons or whatever the case might be, were gonna have problems trying to rebuild and recover from this. So we felt that the only way that we could keep the town together and continue to have a Valmar would be trying to relocate the town. There was a lot of uncertainty. You know, the, the people really wanted to keep the town and to keep the school. They wanted to do that, but it looked like at times it looked like it was just going to be an overwhelming thing. It wasn't the best business decision. You know, at the time it wasn't. You know, but um, it was probably the best decision for all the families that were involved. And, you know, sometimes the best business decision is the one you make from the heart. And that's what we did. Um, they didn't want to be put in this town or that town and be spread out all over the place. They wanted to keep the sense of family together. We got a lot of positive response as to people wanting to keep the community together. So at that point it was whatever it takes. We don't have a clue. There's not a book out there that says this is how you move a flooded town. But if you want to do it, we'll make sure we get it done or do the best we can to try to get it done. First, you didn't know what your future was going to hold, what was going to happen, where we were going to go, what was going to happen with the town. Both places, my, the bank where I worked was flooded. My husband's place of employment, Mar Graphics, it was spared because they built a levee around it with sand base and kept the water out. So at least they could function. But not knowing about my job and our house was very stressful. So when this talk became about, about maybe moving the town, I received a telephone call from Dennis Canobola, wanted to know if I wanted to be a part of helping with the committees to farm the town. Talk about excited because we didn't even think about living anyplace else. There was, there was no choice. Yes, we were on board. We were going to do that. The nuts and bolts would be Dennis Canobola. <laughs> he was the one that pretty well held everything together. He was, he was the backbone, I would say, of the community at that time. He was the one that you know, he took information from everybody, he soaked it all up, he put it on paper, what they wanted, what they needed, and he did his best to see that, you know, everything got put together, and he was the one that pretty well pushed, you know, all the 
FEMA and all the other organizations that you had to go through to get stuff done. One of the things that I found was that of all of the communities that decided to go this direction, we were probably one of the most successful, if not the most successful, in getting done what we were attempting to do. And most of that, I feel, is because we had the citizens involved from the very beginning. We formed seven citizen committees that sat down and did all of the planning to decide how this was all going to be arranged as to how the utility systems were going to be set up, how the school was going to function, what were we going to do with the churches, the emergency services, whatever. The people sat down at the table and planned all of this. It didn't make any difference if you worked in the bank or if you worked at the printing company or if you were a school teacher or whatever your background was, you brought your raw ideas to the table. And then on our side of it, the village made sure we had the specialists there that could help. We had the architects, the engineers, the planners that then took the raw ideas that the people had and turned them into a finished plan. My parents decided to stay in the bottoms because that's just really where they love to live. Uh, they had lived in Pike County, Illinois, and Dad had lived and worked in a river bottom, the Illinois River Bottom, so he enjoyed being in that kind of a, an area, and he really liked living in the country out around Valmire and his house, and he's a kind of a handy guy, so he, he could do the carpentry work and some of the electrical work and the plumbing work uh, to rebuild you know, his house, but he decided that that's where he wanted to be. So he went back, as did maybe about half of the people, I guess, that lived out in the country, uh, did rebuild their homes. Well, with all the farm ground and everything, we, we just like it down here. It's beautiful. You don't have a whole lot of traffic you have to mess with. We both have real good families, and everybody just loves to come down to the farm. When the time of the flood hit, I had two sets of grandparents and my parents that lived along the levee. And the, both sets of my grandparents, uh, one set did not come back. So my brother had purchased their house and has redone it. My parents decided to come back and my other set of grandparents, they also did go back after the flood. So they're still down there because they're farmers and they didn't want to leave because with the agriculture and if you leave your equipment or anything unattended, afraid of people thieving. So they chose to rebuild and go back. You had a lot of those people that ended up uh, um, moving, rebuilding here in town. Um, and that also gave the opportunity for people that really wanted to be part of Almar, but couldn't because we were uh, hamstrung by, by FEMA and the floodplain regulations where we couldn't, Valmar couldn't grow. It was gonna stay the way it was and actually decline over time. You know, because there was no way to, to to, to grow the village. That gave the opportunity now, here in the new village, the opportunity for those people that really wanted to come home to Valmar. A lot of people describe the new town as driving into a, just a large subdivision because everything was built about the same time. Unlike uh, the old town that had um, older, nostalgic looking houses. Uh, so even though I love the town, sometimes it doesn't, it's not home. Everyone says it's not the same, but at the same time, those house lots in Old Valmire might have been 60, 65 feet wide, and everyone that built a new house wanted a more contemporary, wider front house with a front-loaded garage. People in Old Valmire had garages off of alleys, or they had garages off the uh, side street, and you know, it just didn't quite work out the same way. Plus, you know, not everyone from Old Valmire ended up here in town, but. If you uh, look over in like Woodland Ridge, there are four or five houses whose occupants were determined by, we used to be neighbors in the old town and we're gonna be neighbors in the new town. So they're not exactly in the same order, but they're all near each other. I think the new town's a great place. It's, you know, it's quiet and we still have some of the community togetherness. It's not like it was in the old town but we still have all that community, the people band together when needed. and Even though we might talk about New Valmar and Old Valmar, it is Valmar. 
and even though we now go up the hill for the main part of it, we still go down the hill for the people and the part of the town that is still uh, in the old Valmar. And to me, seeing the fact that the, the people of this town have have stepped up to do this and the work that was done by Dennis Knobloch and other people have been outstanding. The church is making the commitment to build a new church. I you know the three churches in Valmar, the school going through that whole effort of bringing a building a new school system within the town uh, it kept really the community together because without all that effort there would the Valmar would not be on the map. To imagine what we have now, wow, new houses, new new school. When we before the flood happened, we tried to pass a referendum to get a new gym, and it failed. Somehow in the back of my mind, I think, well, there was a reason for that because now we have a brand new gym. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, I may still be, you know, in the, I don't want to say in the phase of denial. You know, I may dream at night, you know, the old school and the, the thing, wake up thinking the things were the way they were when obviously they're not. You know, and you always think you'll glance over there and there it'll stand, but no, it doesn't. So it, uh, so there's an empty kind of a feeling when you drive down there, you know, and you got to take solace in the fact that, hey, come up top of the hill, you know, we got a school that's a palace compared to the school that we had down in the old town. And I laugh inside when some of the teachers or coaches complain that they don't like their gym the way it is, because I just wish I could drag them back to the old one and say, look, buddy, this thing that you got is so much nicer than what we had had that uh, you really don't appreciate what, what we've been given. The flood of 93 was very traumatic. And I will tell you from my standpoint, and I, I know not everyone is affected as I have been, but unfortunately, if I see any disaster on the news, uh, a flood, a hurricane, anything involving water, you can bet that in the next few weeks, I'm gonna have nightmares. This is constantly haunting me that's never gone away. And I know it hasn't for other people, but that's just, you know, these, the hurricanes are the, the things that happen down on the coastline. It just comes, it brings it up and it's real time for me because my parents and my brother still live down in the old town. So it's real time. So I'm thinking about how I can help them out to get them back up here or get them to safety. So that part has never left me. It just, it's deep in there, I guess. It just won't go away. It's, you're always thinking about that it could happen anytime the river jumps up, which it does very quick anymore. The water just comes in so fast that the river, it'll jump 10 foot in just a couple, few days. You always think about it, but you just hope it doesn't happen. You ride it out again, right? Well, you almost have to. Hopefully, hopefully that doesn't happen because I was, I was a lot younger than when the last one came through. We used to spend a lot of money maintaining Old Valmar because all of the property was given back to Village when the federal government bought it out. So we were spending a lot of money having it maintained and mowed, trying to keep it looking nice. And the Village at one point decided, hey, we got a farmer who wants to farm some of this property. Um, it'll be income for the village, so now where my house used to be is a bean field. As a result of the relocation of the town, one of the problems that we ran into was that we found out that Columbia Quarry Company owned the mineral rights under the area where we were going to build the new town. It wasn't a major concern for us because we knew the details of the mineral rights arrangement and we weren't concerned that it was going to be a problem for our future development. But the state and federal agencies that we were dealing with in helping us provide the funding that we needed to build the new town here, they considered that to be a cloud on the title. Eventually, the only way we could clear that was to try to buy the mineral rights. It wasn't as easy as buying the mineral rights. We eventually had to wind up buying the quarry complex in total, which gave us the mineral rights then so we could continue with the new town development. So at that point, Valmar 
uh, took out a loan and we bought a rock quarry that we didn't want, but uh, in order for us to continue our development, we ended up with a rock quarry. We started looking around at some of the different options that we had, and one of the things that we found was that in numerous areas around the country, especially locally here in the Kansas City area, and then in the Pennsylvania area, there's also quite a bit of this type of activity where they take abandoned limestone quarries and they turn them into some type of business facilities. Uh, we had a couple different developers that came down and had this idea of developing this and uh, finally we had a gentleman who came who had some contacts, had some money and now we have a development that's bringing money back to the community of Valmar. Right now the quarry has been turned into a warehousing area uh, where we have the 10-acre National Archives and we also have a three-acre freezer. Uh, the village earns money, uh, or a percentage of the lease or rent money that's collected from the tenants, and it helps provide us with city services, whether it's police services or uh, whatever. But it's, it's serving, uh, you know, just like the example of making uh, lemonade from lemons. You know, we were given a lemon, we got a huge pile of property here, we got a quarry that's, we're not a quarry, but we're putting it to use, where a positive use, where otherwise it would have been something that our police would have had to uh, chase kids out of, and just a, a problem. As a result of the village purchasing the quarry property, not only did we get the underground portion of the quarry, we also got the bluff top that went along with it. We realized in looking at that, we knew what was there throughout the years before. It's a beautiful forested bluff top area. We, in talking with the folks at the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, realized that we had one of the largest areas of natural development there that contained a lot of threatened and endangered species. We had the possibility of maintaining that property and what better type of facility to have next to a town than an 800 acre bluff top area that could eventually be developed for park and trail area and things like that. This is one of the unique areas of Illinois. Most of Illinois is uh, now farmland. It was probably 90 percent prairie at one time and we have remnant hilltop prairies and glades on this. So we have plant species here actually that are only found in uh, Randolph and Monroe County. Started working with the Department of Natural Resources and we were able to work with them in establishing some leasehold arrangements on the uh, facility so we agreed that we would not allow any kind of development on that area in return for some dollars from them. So again, that all helped us in the rebuilding process and paying for some of the things that we needed to do here to make the village work. Valmar is special to me because you know, I feel that, uh, you know, our family was instrumental in, in helping make it grow. And I've invested a lot of time and money into this town, um, you know, to see that it does, that it does grow. And, you know, and hopefully, you know, uh, my legacy will be that, you know, hey, he was one of the guys that helped uh, make this happen. There's something in me about Valmar that uh, it, it even chokes me up a little bit to talk about it, you know, it, uh, I have a special, Special thing about it. Yeah. It's just an awesome sight to, uh, to see that stuff when you're running down the railroad and you know, beautiful sunrise, beautiful sunset. It's just a very, very special place and always will be. And I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I always loved Valmire. With the flood fight, the process that went along after that, the rebuilding or recovery, the relocation. Um, it just kind of got tattooed onto my body and 
Um, there's, there's no way, you know, we've talked about it, different people have asked throughout the years, you know, wouldn't it be easier just to move away and, and do something else or whatever? And, you know, my feeling on that, and I've always told my wife that the only way I'm leaving Valmar is when they carry me out. I love the town, I love everything about it, and I'll do anything I can to see it keep going. Done. 